Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, Joseph and I are going to discuss a fairy tale and reference a couple of others from Hans Christian Andersen. Lisa can't be with us today, so Joseph and I are, are going to look at these tales that have acquired the status of fairy tales, even though they were written far more recently. Hans Christian Andersen um, had an ability to tap into the mythic layer, the mythopoetic layer of the collective unconscious in a way that has been widely recognized. And so we are going to take a look at one of his short stories first, The Princess and the Pea, and Joseph is going to read it to us. So sit back and enjoy the tale. There was once a prince who wanted to marry a princess, but she must be a real princess, mind you. So he traveled all around the world, seeking such a one. But everywhere, something was in his way. Not that there was any lack of princesses, but he could not seem to make out whether they were real princesses. There was always something not quite satisfactory. Therefore, home he came again, quite out of spirits, for he wished so much to marry a real princess. One evening a terrible storm came on. It thundered and lightened, and the rain poured down. Indeed, it was quite fearful. In the midst of it there came a knock at the town gate, and the old king went to open it. It was a princess who stood outside. But, oh dear, what a state she was in from the rain and bad weather. The water dropped from her hair and clothes. It ran in at the tips of her shoes and out the heels, yet she insisted she was a real princess. Very well, thought the old queen. That we shall presently see. She said nothing, but went into the bedchamber and took off all the bedding, then laid a pea on the sacking of the bedstead. Having done this, she took twenty mattresses and laid them upon the pea, and placed twenty eider-down beds on top of the mattress. The princess lay upon this bed all night. In the morning she was asked how she slept. Oh, most miserably, she said. I scarcely closed my eyes the whole night through. I cannot think what there could have been in that bed. I lay upon something so hard that I am quite black and blue all over. It is dreadful. It was now quite evident that she was a real princess, since through twenty mattresses and twenty eider-down beds she had felt the pea. None but a real princess could have such delicate feeling. So the prince took her for his wife, for he knew that in her he had found a true princess, and the pea was preserved in the cabinet of curiosities, where it is still to be seen, unless someone has stolen it. And this, mind you, is a real story. You know, I think I better begin uh, with a personal confession uh, to you and all our listeners, which is that as a child, when I read this story, I so identified with the princess. <laughs> and uh, I think I really missed a lot of uh, it, its real import because I felt uh, very identified with the poor bedraggled princess uh, who somehow proved herself uh, through her sensitivity and was then recognized uh, by the court and was was claimed. 
In other words, I, I really experienced it as a kind of Cinderella story. And yet here we are today, and there's quite a bit more, I think, for us to explore, deliberate, and discover. Well, just starting with the fairy tale, much in the way we might look at a dream, often we'll try to discern or, or decide, are we going to interpret this as if this is a dream that's happening in the psyche of a male, or is this a dream that's happening in the psyche of a female. And the reason that we would do that is it would place the ego in one character and often the other psychic factors in the additional characters. And the dance between the ego and the other unconscious factors is one of the ways that we achieve a kind of interpretive stance. So I'd like to start with the assumption that this is the dream of our prince who is longing to marry a real princess. And he looks and he looks, but every single time something is wrong, something's the matter. And so if we start with the prince as the seeking ego, seeking his other half, his love object, his animo, you know, what do we have in the woman who appears at the city gates. Well, we'll even just staying with that first paragraph, and we're thinking about the young man in any culture, as well as in this kind of myth, who at a certain point feels it's time to search for the mate, which is a real developmental place for young men to find. I also found myself thinking a little bit about typology. When I think about the various men that I have in my private practice, I'm curious always about their Myers-Briggs typology. And I find that the men who are of a a P type versus a J type, like an INFP, the perceiving type has a very, very difficult time claiming one thing for itself, because any time there is a claiming, all the other options are foreclosed upon. So claiming the princess would mean that all the other princesses are suddenly no longer available for consideration. So I have a fantasy in that first paragraph that the prince is kind of like an INFP type, where he's going out and he's dating and he's searching after searching, but there's something inside of him that just refuses to let him lay claim to an appropriate partner, to be able to say, this is the one that I love or want or I'm willing to sacrifice for. But something in the ego, something in the prince's ego keeps telling him, no, 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 don't do that. Don't bind yourself to this relationship. And that, that is not an uncommon state. I am wondering about whether there might also be a lot of ambivalence that in his conscious state, the prince is looking for a princess, a mate. But unconsciously, uh, something is holding him back. Uh, something that he is not aware of, he hasn't acknowledged And so he's looking for something that he really cannot consciously identify. It seems like he's engaged in the search for a mate, but something is hindering him. Certainly, I think both of us have seen that in our practices. Uh, And it might not always be a mate. It might be a career goal. It might be... uh, you know, any kind of life satisfaction of something is wanted, but it hasn't really been sufficiently well identified. Uh, and, and the ambivalence um, has also not really been fully acknowledged. That's That rings true. And as you were talking, Deb, I was thinking about just his quest for the real princess and just wondering, What's going on in that dream ego's mind versus what, a false princess or an inadequate princess? 
but the idea of the real princess, I'm just kind of wondering how to how one would translate that into a kind of a psychological metaphor. You know, what I'm thinking about is that there has to be some feeling. And our prince, um, so far, he, he's engaged as if this was some kind of a research project. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, maybe in today's world, he would go on OkCupid and Match.com uh, and some some mixers and meet and greets and alumni events and all the rest of it. And yet what he really needs is to meet somebody who sparks in him that element of feeling, of desire, uh, that was mentioned in the song from South Pacific, um, one enchanted evening across a crowded room, you will meet a stranger. He doesn't really know what he's looking for. And he's going about it in a very ego-oriented way. And that isn't going to do the trick. I can imagine that situation as we've seen it with our analysis from time to time. I'm also wondering if, though he is looking for a real princess, he doesn't actually know what that means. It's almost like it's a title that he's inherited uh-huh. from some kind of larger system, perhaps from the king and the queen themselves or some kind of courtly idea. So even though you can have a, a title for the thing you're looking for, if you don't know enough about it, you won't be able to recognize it when you come across it on the road. And what happens in the rest of the tale is that it's the queen who is the one who provides the context to recognize the princess, or in essence, the queen is the first one who recognizes her. So it's also suggesting that when the prince is not in a kind of merger with the inner mother, and he's out on his own, he hasn't developed enough individual discernment on his own, that the ego hasn't made that heroic separation from the mother complex or from the unconscious, that he still needs to rely on the mother to tell him who the right mate is. So we have a bit of a problem right in the beginning, or we're surmising it, that this is an ego that has not really fully separated Mm -hmm. out, is not quite its own captain, so to speak, and doesn't kind of know what it wants and therefore cannot discriminate. Our prince doesn't know what he's looking for. Um, All he knows is it has to be a real princess. So it's equated somehow with status, but how to determine that? And I would uh, venture to say that um, the males in this kingdom, his father, the old king, doesn't really know either because when someone knocks at the city gate and the king goes down to open it, um, he just, he lets her in. She, all she has to do is say, hey, you know what, I'm the real deal. Uh, let me in. I'm a princess. I know you're looking for one. Here I am. Well, she sure doesn't present uh, in, in the way that we would imagine a princess presenting. And who knows what to do? Um, our future mother-in-law. Uh, who knows how to conduct the test. Uh, We'll find out if she's a real princess or not. And then comes this hilarious test that I think wasn't, it was made into a musical uh, at one point called um, Once Upon a Mattress with Carol Burnett, uh, which was a comedic, charming. uh, charming and comedic musical. But it's interesting that it is the old queen who has this kind of canny ability, uh, although it's presented in this uh, very humorous way. And the old queen has a kind of value system. I mean, she's decided that this extraordinary, almost overwhelming sensitivity to irritation is going to be the sign that she's a true princess and <laughs> those have other kinds of magical qualities that make her worth it. But it, 
it's so difficult, <laughs> I guess, in the modern psyche to imagine that you need to find the most excruciatingly sensitive person who's going to be just bruised by the tiniest chafing in the environment, you know, and that's the right one. By that horrible pee. By that horrible oh. abusive pee, you know. <laughs> so I think, uh, I think it's hard for us to understand. I don't know. Hans Christian Andersen apparently did collect folk tales from the culture he was embedded in, but then um, changed them into morality tales and altered them. But generally speaking, many fairy tales are, are quite old and from an oral tradition. So it's hard for us as moderns to, to understand what that extraordinary sensitivity might have meant to somebody in a far distant time. And I suppose maybe that was idealized in some way. So we haven't um, jumped into one lens, which is that the dream ego being the prince is searching for his anima. And the anima, based on Jung's psychology, is this internal feminine figure that generates connectedness, tenderness, relatedness, creativity, um, contact with one's feelings, and eventually contact with the self. If a man can really find and cultivate a relationship with this inner soulfulness, and something has happened, at least in the beginning of the tale, where the prince is finally having a longing to discover perhaps even his interiority. In a way, you know, of course, the first woman in every man's wife is life is his, his mother. And so we have the old queen who is a canny old soul, and she has a means of testing. And then we have our princess who is the diametric opposite, we might imagine, uh, of the old queen. Uh, our princess is bedraggled and hypersensitive uh, in opposition to the old queen's, let's see about that. And so I wonder, in a way, if uh, the tale presents these two inner opposites of hypersensitivity on the part of our princess and um, this canny uh, testing, ha, 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 you can't fool me, old queen. And also I'm thinking that, you know, in myth and legend, to, to what's a princess? It's the superior or highest state that can either sort of kill the aspirant. And we have a lot of tales about uh, a, a princess uh, who is testing her suitors. And if they don't win her hand, they die. Like the sea hare. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or, or King Thrushbeard. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are hoping that our princess will raise the prince, you know, sort of to, to a more noble, higher uh, state of development. And so it's interesting that as part of his anima, you know, our princess is this hyper, hyper sensitive young woman, uh, which may be something that our prince lacks. After all, he was not even sensitive enough after all his uh, interviews and online dating to select a woman for himself. I think that's a really important lens because it's easy, again, from a modern perspective to think about this extremely sensitive princess um, as almost kind of a joke or even a, a pathology for somebody to be so intolerant of discomfort. But if we think about it as an intelligent compensation by the self for an insensitive male ego, then the princess becomes more medicinal in that psychic environment. And I can, in fact, imagine that when I've seen men, for instance, who have a trauma history, they get very encapsulated. Their spouses often feel like they can't reach them, can't connect to them. They're too cut off, thinking of various kinds of narcissistic character structures that also lock a fellow into a very insensitive psychological state. And how finding the anima 
that is very vulnerable and very responsive would be both a revelation and a challenge, of course, for that to be an active principle in certain men's psyches, and yet helpful. Yes. And what's interesting is that this hypersensitivity is recognized and welcomed in this tale. Mm-hmm. You know, instead of saying, oh, what a ninny. Oh, you're kidding me. Really? Uh, and it's a P? Oh, no. They say, wow, you really, you definitely are the real deal. Uh, only a real princess could be so sensitive. So this is a missing element in this family constellation. We could imagine just adding our own fantasies to the tale that that this very sensitive soul at some point had been banished out into the wilderness and it kind of comes back in the midst of a terrible storm drenched in rain. I mean, this doesn't look like a princess who comes in a carriage with a retinue and um, all kinds of gifts and symbols of prestige. I mean, she is, she is a young feminine that is out in the wild, that has found her way to the door of the village. And so it also suggests that at some point, the prince's sensitivity had been banished to the unconscious. In a lot of cultures, young men learn that their sensitivities, emotional, spiritual, relational sensitivities, have to be pushed away, that that doesn't meet the vision of of manhood in terms of being tough and unaffected by all kinds of things. So in that way, as you had said, Deb, earlier, the return of the sensitive soul that has been pushed out into the forest, so to speak, heralds an integrative opportunity. We could even imagine that the old king, which can sometimes be an image of the self, in this really tricky way, just pads out to the to the gate and just cracks it and you know lets the princess in and then we don't hear anything else from him and everything else is just playing the way it is and sometimes the self does play a little trick on us just goes and lets something in that's going to be a change agent without even saying much about it and then lo and behold a kind of catalyzing occurs but i'm wondering now if we were to change the lens which is often really fun to do and now say, well, what if this was a dream that was being dreamed by a, a female so that her relationship to the figures might be quite different? So the dream ego is now the princess. Well, when we first meet our princess, she is outside in this terrible storm with thunder, lightning, and bucketfuls of rain coming down. And she is literally all wet, uh, and she's in exile. She's standing outside the city gates, banging on the door, and announcing to the rest of the dream cast of characters, hey, guess what? I'm a real princess. Let me in. It is so interesting that, you know, in a way, uh, if we say sometimes the least trustworthy attitude is the attitude of the dream ego here, the dream ego is presenting uh, in a very unprincess like manner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, she's uh, she's bedraggled. She doesn't look magical and all done yeah. up, and she's 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 tough. You know, to kind of come up to a castle and just pound on the door until they let you in, and you put a finger out and you say, "I'm a princess." You know, give me yeah. some help over here. She's yeah. uh, she's got some muscle. Yes, she, for, for somebody who's portrayed as so sensitive that she can feel the pee under all these mattresses and eider downs, she's also got a lot of moxie. No kidding. You know, you might think that I just look like some you know, street person uh, soaking wet, uh, but I, I'm the real deal. So our princess has the ability to claim her authority. And she doesn't need to arrive in uh, a special carriage with a retinue of servants 
and beautiful white horses. No, no, I'm a princess, and I'm banging on the gate, and you better let me in. So <laughs> our princess has um, qu quite a lot of tough stuff. She does. She's got agency. She has focus. <laughs> in that opening scene, she seems remarkably resilient, very different from what happens towards the end of the dream. But you're right. She's a tough cookie. And again, it's not in the tale, but we can even fantasize that moment between the princess and the king. And she's able to engage the dominant value system in this part of the psyche and somehow to convince that part that she is valuable and she deserves passage into this. So she's already had a kind of triumph right there in the beginning between her and the old king. And I would imagine again, if the king is once again a self figure, that these um, superordinate images do have a deeper sense of what's happening and what's true in the right course of things. It's interesting to consider if this is the dream that the princess has, a kind of completeness uh, in her own psyche mm -hmm. of uh, her assertiveness and sense of entitlement and authority, plus her ability to intuit uh, what this other royal family, the rest of her own psyche, is going to require. And I, uh, now I'm just sort of playing with the idea that, you know, did, did she kind of suss out the old queen and the fact that this must be a trick? Mm. Or once she was within the royal confines of, of this castle, uh, could she allow herself to let down her defenses and, and truly is sensitive enough to feel the tiniest uh, little, little irritation represented by the P? There are a lot of opposites coming into play here in the princess, uh, in this royal family, her ability to pass tests. I think I'm enjoying that idea of her having a little trickster in her pocket. <laughs> but, you know, she knows she's a princess. She's been raised in court. She's been raised around kings and queens. So we might imagine that she she knows this game. You know, she, she's one she's one step ahead of the old queen. Um, and she knows perhaps what what's expected in that way, which I find that's a very interesting way of uh, of looking at that tale. I'm also wondering if the P represents some kind of a bruising dynamic in again in the girl's psyche between her and the negative mother complex even as she's been rescued even as she is in process of meeting her animus figure and a really positive animus figure that's going to really be with her and provide a lot of creative dynamism ostensibly but in her psyche is this mother complex that just doesn't destroy things, but she puts this little seed, this little achy, bruising seed into the mix. Because the bed is also potentially the marital bed. And there is a way in which, you know, our mother complexes can, can just poke, nip, just kind of spoil things if we're not being really careful about them. And she's aware of the mother complex, that even that little itty bitty pee, oh, she knows it's there and it bruises her. So uh, my, my fantasy is that after they get married, uh, she's going to reach underneath all those mattresses and make sure there aren't any more peas. She's a tough cookie. She's aware and she can use that awareness to enhance her own well-being and achieve her own goals. She, she's not going to let mother-in-law interfere. Right. And, and the, the marriage does happen. So whatever this little pokey testing quality 
Um, she is still able to, to achieve what she wants. I'm also interested just in the P itself. <laughs> okay, say more well, about the P. <laughs> in as much as a P is a seed. Mm -hmm. So when I think about it that way, that the mother principle puts a seed into the bed and that the dream ego has such a reaction to this potential for new life, which makes it a little bit more ambivalent that way. Ostensibly, when she marries the prince, there will be a seeding process in terms of <laughs> fecundity and bearing children and continuing the royal lineage. So then it, make, it makes the seed being so uncomfortable to her a little more cringy. It, like, it troubles me a little bit more that, you know, the seed is not, not welcomed, you know, in the marital bed. That's tricky. <laughs> you know, I am enjoying and somewhat surprised as we have wended our way through this very, very short little fairy tale and had a little bit tongue in cheek uh, because it's a satire. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hans Christian Andersen is really poking fun at uh, all, all this um, sort of royal sense of itself and n narcissistic inflation and, and silliness uh, about, about the P. And yet, everything we've talked about is also there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what gives his tales a kind of depth. Why they've survived and st are still in print. And, and that they have merited this kind of mythopoetic status. They've been made into plays, made into movies, uh, because all these other factors of psychic reality are truly there, um, e even in this little satire. And I'm thinking about... Um, Another satire that I, has made it into uh, everybody's uh, recognition of the emperor's new clothes. Another Hans Christian Andersen tale that, that everybody knows, everybody seems to recognize. Yes, of the um, inflated uh, empire emperor who is so fond of beautiful new clothes, he spent all his money on attire. And then these two swindlers come into the kingdom and they go through this elaborate play acting uh, of weaving something on the womb, loom that uh, everybody feels they must admire. And uh, the emperor doesn't want to look stupid or insensitive or anything less than royal. So it must be there, this amazing garment that they're weaving. The emperor says, okay, it's lovely. It has my approval. And uh, so then, of course, he, they dress him in this uh, non-existent robe, uh, and off he goes to process in front of, of uh, all the people in his kingdom who were lining the streets. And everybody at first says, wow, wow, the emperor's new clothes are just beautiful. What a magnificent robe. And the train, how well his clothes suit him. And no one uh, was willing to admit they hadn't seen a thing. For if anyone did, then he was either stupid or unfit for the job he held. So never before had the emperor's clothes been such a success. But he doesn't have anything on, cried a little child. Listen to the innocent one, said the proud father, and the people whispered and repeated what the child had said. And everyone shouts eventually, oh gosh, he has nothing on. And then here's the ending. The emperor shivered, for he was certain they were right, but he thought, I must bear it until the procession is over. And he walked even more proudly. And the two gentlemen of the imperial bedchamber went on carrying the train that wasn't there. So here in this tale, 
there's a really an overt skewering of, of the kind of dynamic that allows such a such a scenario to take place. This kind of persona oriented pride. I must preserve my persona at any cost. Even though I know I oh dear God, I'm naked in front of the whole entire kingdom, but I'm gonna carry on. <laughs> so in that way, Hans Christian Anderson is functioning in the rule uh, in the role of the fool in many courts that he's going to tell the story that brings forward the ridiculousness of the court or the crown or the various power figures. You know, the princess who's so oversensitive she can't even sleep if there's a pee. The emperor is walking around butt naked, you know, sure <laughs> that he's wearing a magical, invisible <laughs> outfit. These, of course, exaggerations, but, you know, he is saying something. He's... He is humanizing the royalty, which is a kind of medicinal movement in time towards something that is uh, a democracy or a republic where these figures are not so venerated and are seen as, you know, full of foibles and full of vulnerabilities. Here, I think also, if there's a much sharper skewering. The tone in The Princess and the Pea uh, was somehow good-humored. It isn't at all in good fun. And it's just a, a kind of uh, silliness. But here in The Emperor uh, and His New Clothes, it's much sharper, satirical, pointed, jabbing. Much more shaming. Yes. Yeah. The, the vanity of the emperor and all his sycophants, mm -hmm. uh, who, if, you know, if the emperor says, I guess, two and two make seven, that the sycophants would say, oh, yes, oh, king, how wise you are. How, how amazing that you could um, add it up to a, a much greater total of our ability to, to, to go along with for the sake of uh, preserving our own skin. And, you know, I'm thinking about how many applications uh, this has <laughs> in the collective right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. who, who will speak up and say what's what versus I better go along to get along. And we'll be afraid of the power of structure. And so we're going to just echo whatever it speaks back to it so that it's satisfied. Yeah. As, uh, what if his wise men lose their jobs? It's a really interesting commentary on a very real uh, psychological dynamic uh, of when we appease, when we comply when we, you know, we might say in a common sense way, well, I know which side my bread's buttered on. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, if my boss you know, wants his reports written in green ink, why, by God, I'm going to write them in green ink. And then we go home and say, oh, my God, you wouldn't believe what he asked for today. Oh, my God, this guy is. It is a child who is innocent of all of these social constructs elaborately created in this uh, mythical kingdom who just spits it out and gives permission or opens the way for all the rest of the townspeople to say, oh my God, uh, ain't it the truth? The guy's butt naked. So if we think about this, if this were a dream and the emperor is the dream ego, that the dream ego is kind of moving around in a way that it is not related to reality, that it is, is, is in some kind of a fantastical belief system, and that these defenses, psychological defenses, have surrounded the ego simply reaffirming what its choices are without seeing that they're destructive or humiliating or shameful 
And the system just keeps going on and on and on to more and more extreme behaviors. And it's not until the child and the divine child, again, can be the seed of the self, something that is outside the defense system, is able to introduce a reality principle into the psyche, which can be felt as catastrophic. What's interesting in the tale, which I think is very sophisticated, is that the emperor, I would imagine, is aware of this information, but he continues his behavior anyway, which Jung called the regressive restoration of the persona. But even there, there's a moment to come into the reality principle that the emperor just doubles down and just keeps marching along, you know, greeting the peasantry, you know, buck naked. Uh, It's such a persona tale of what our clothes and uh, all of our accoutrements uh, by which we present ourselves. That's what this emperor is about. He's a... There was an emperor who was so terribly fond of beautiful new clothes that he spent all his money on attire. And in fact, he had a new outfit for every hour of the day. So this is such a a vivid outpicturing of how I must look. I must look grand uh, and fashionable. And that when this little child at the end just... in in the compensatory function of other aspects of the psyche, just punctures the persona of you're you're naked. He's got nothing on. Uh, Just as you said, uh, the emperor does not learn from this. He insists on this restoration of his persona. I will maintain my grand stature I will uh, bear it until the procession is over. And he walked even more proudly. Of how hard it can be uh, for us to accept uh, the information from another part of the psyche that says, you know what, Uh, you're just full of it. I find myself um, suddenly thinking about a counterpoint to that which in in a sense is kind of a mythology around St. Francis of Assisi. Huh. There's a wonderful movie. It has this wonderful lyric quality to it called Brother, Son, Sister, Moon, which was a dramatization of the life of St. Francis of Assisi. And as he is hearing his religious calling and is internalizing these Christian principles, He's trying to communicate that to his parents and his family, and they just cannot come to a listening place. And so St. Francis takes all of his belongings, his clothing, his jewelry, all of his status, and he just casts it into the courtyard of his wealthy family and renounces them and walks off into the wilderness naked. And so we have this kind of parallel process where we have two male ego, uh, dream egos, that are walking away naked. But boy, Mm. really different stories and different value systems there, where one is a casting off of the old thing and becoming a child again, as we are born into the world naked, and going on to his path and all that must be left behind Mm -hmm. to be the person that he is designed to be versus the emperor in the Hans Christian Andersen story who is naked because of these strange character defects and vulnerabilities um, in his personality and his nakedness is not inspiring. It's, it's terrible and shameful to watch and embarrassing. And yet, you know, you still have two men walking around naked you know, through yeah. the village. St. Francis in this story 
can be naked uh, because he doesn't need all these accoutrements of persona. He doesn't need defenses. He doesn't need any kind of cover-up. He is whole enough to be undefended, vulnerable, without the need for any of these uh, persona-affiliated kinds of things. Whereas the king in the, the emperor in the, in the Hans Christian Andersen tale has simply been stripped of his defenses. And he hasn't learned anything. He has not become more whole. Uh, so we, you know, we can imagine looking upon him and it's just cringeworthy. It's like, oh, I really don't want to have to see that. The tiny bit of hope if we think about it as a dream, is that the psyche still has that little truth-telling child in it, which frankly could be the real center of the personality, that the emperor is a kind of false self that has been propped up and paraded around. But this little authentic self and this weird, uh, grotesque, false self, you know, have an encounter. And even though it, he, he doubled down on his behavior and he still walked along, but that encounter still happened. And much like analysis, there's that little encounter could take years before that encounter takes root. And then the system really does start to change. And he has the help of all the populace uh, because the populace then echoes the child, and they all shout, he has nothing on. I think you're absolutely right. It's a real seed of, of hope, because the collective, inspired by the authenticity uh, of the young, authentic part of the psyche, all grabs hold of this. And I imagine, you know, if we could write the, the tale on or dream the dream on, uh, that, that things would be different once he got back to the palace. Might rethink a few things. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and his, his desire to restore his persona, something has shifted. It's, uh, this, this is not real anymore. We, we can't go along with it. We've seen and heard something new that uh, can't be undone. It can't be unsaid. It can't be unseen. So I'm wondering if... Other than the poke at the royalty in both The Princess and the Pea and The Emperor's New Clothes, I'm wondering if we're seeing any other kind of crossovers between the stories. What comes up for me is that in both of these short stories and underneath the poking fun and the satire, it is a really poignant call for authenticity and that 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 matters uh, especially I think it's very poignant um, in the in the emperor's new clothes and I think often we read that as a ha 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 you know look at that silly emperor you know riding through the town butt naked and he hasn't learned anything but I think we all relate it he is us. Yep, exactly. <laughs> a lot of the time, for and sure. When, when do we put on airs? An interesting phrase, because we're not putting on uh, garments. We're putting on airs, something that isn't there, that's transparent, has no substance. Yeah, that we use kind of ridiculous fantasy material to imagine that we have improved ourselves. <laughs> Right. My Lamborghini. Uh, and that makes me special. Makes me more than I was before I had the Lamborghini. So he's skewering all of the, you know, basically status symbols by which we wish to make ourselves more than we were before. And he's inflated. Mm -hmm. And that even just the the way the tailors or the, the con men 
He's <laughs> telling him how how wonderful and and beautiful and how magnificent he is. Yeah. You know, wearing this, you know, invisible clothing. And in the way that we can be inflated by non-reality. You know, we think of this incredible, for instance, online world. Yes. All the things that people get involved in that don't actually provide anything, anything for them, either psychologically or tangibly. And yet there's a false sense of status and superiority because, you know, I want a candy crush, you know, <laughs> an X number of level, and I've been playing it for 10 hours a week for, you know, six months. You know, there's a way in which all of that is a bit of the emperor's new clothes, thinking that something that is actually a non-thing has enhanced me and enhanced me in a way that all people will recognize mm -hmm. and, uh, and agree with. So there's, there's something very humbling yeah. about both of the tales for that matter. Mm -hmm. And with your mention of the word humbling, uh, brings up the diametric opposite, which is a tale that everybody also knows of the ugly duckling. And our ugly duckling is uh, rejected and persecuted and exiled and put down a, a, all, you know, a series of things. He is humbled. Uh, he has what we might call today, he's really got low self esteem. <laughs> And it says, it would be too horrible to tell of all the hardship and suffering the duckling, as he thought of himself, experienced that long winter. It's enough to know that he did survive. When the sun again shone warmly and the larks began to sing, the duckling was lying among the reeds in the swamp. Spring had come. And let's hear that sentence really symbolically and metaphorically. That something about the world and the warmth still infused him uh, with a sense of life. He spread out his wings to fly. How strong and powerful they were. Before he knew it, he was far from the swamp, flying above a beautiful garden. So there again, goodbye swamp, hello garden. The apple trees were blooming, the lilac bushes Everything was so beautiful, so fresh and green. So there's a new beginning. Out of a forest of rushes came three swans. They ruffled their feathers and floated so lightly on the water. The ugly duckling recognized the birds and felt again that strange sadness come over him. I shall fly over to them, those royal birds, and they can hack me to death because I who am so ugly, dare to approach them, what difference does it make? It is better to be killed by them than to be bitten by the other ducks and pecked by the hens and kicked by the girl who tends the hen yard or to suffer through the winter. And he lighted on the water and swam toward the magnificent swans. When they saw him, they ruffled their feathers and started to swim in his direction. They were coming to meet him. Kill me, whispered the poor creature, and bent his head humbly while he waited for death. But what was that he saw in the water? It was his own reflection, and he was no longer an awkward, clumsy gray bird, so ungainly and so ugly. He was a swan. And then it says he's thankful he'd known so much want and gone through so much suffering for it made him appreciate his present happiness and the loveliness of everything about him all the more. The swans made a circle around him and caressed him with their beaks. I think it's impossible to read that or hear it without feeling teary. Mm. And it is the polar opposite of the other two tales. If we were to think of all three as a dream series, mm. We might imagine the way that the duckling, P, the child who tells the truth, that all of those are waiting to blossom into a full dynamic self that can be recognized. And through that, 
find its true tribe, its true kin mm -hmm. in the world, the place where we fit, where we belong. So I, I love thinking about those as kind of a three progressive dreams and how wonderful it would be to have that final dream, how remarkable that would be. I think that's right on. I really love your idea of, of this as a dream series. And, you know, Jung says that dreams are compensatory and that is their essential function. So we have uh, the satire of royalty brought low or royalty that thinks it's so special uh, in the first two tales. And now we have the dream ego as our ugly duckling. And the compensatory function is the discovery of swanliness. And swans were the royal bird. That if you're humble, if you have suffered and survived, and if you can respond to the call simply of the beauty of spring, then Psyche meets you and greets you uh, with this kind of recognition represented by the other swans. And then it goes on that the children come out and they welcome the swans and they uh, feed the swans cake and bread and so on. But the, those who believe that they are high and haughty are, are poked fun at. Uh, Psyche compensates by jabbing them with a sharp stick. And, and those who are humble are recognized as whole. Uh, as, and I think swans are such a symbol of the self and figure in fairy tales as images of nobility. I think in several religious traditions as well, the, the swan is, is a symbol of a, the guru or the divine, yeah. Yeah. all kinds of exquisite higher values associated with the image of the swan. <laughs> There is a poignant Irish fairy tale about a stepmother who turns her stepchildren into swans, and they suffer for something like 600 years before finally being redeemed. The children of Lear. The children of Lear. It, is, it, it just it is so poignant, uh, such a tale of unmerited suffering uh, and eventual redemption. And the Irish have a special place in their culture for swans. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like we've had a wonderful, uh, like just sitting here with our coffee cups, circumambulating oh. around a bunch of fairy tales and which is by the way, everybody, what we do every morning. That's what, <laughs> that's what breakfast and coffee looks like in our world. Yeah. It has been, I'm just thinking about the feeling tone here of wandering through these tales and together and finding a depth and finding a truth. And isn't that what can happen if we look, if we look almost anywhere? That we can find a little bit. And it's if we can just toy with the symbolic lens, if we can just take away the literalism and just ask these questions. Well, what if I was this character? What if I was that character? What does this object mean if we thought about it as a psychological um, phenomena of some kind? That, that can just open up a lot of playful ways to think about it. And just as Dev and I demonstrated, there's no right answer. We're just playing. We're just playing around with the images and seeing what lights up and seeing if anything is interesting as a result of that. Yeah. Which is perhaps an attitude that we can carry as we look at a dream. Did you know your dreams reveal the wisdom of your guiding self? Dreams connect us to the secret world within and remind us that we're never alone. We're always accompanied by our inner companion who offers healing, balance, insight, and guidance as we make key decisions. At 28, Charles felt lost and isolated. He had a dream that touched him deeply. As he worked with the dream in dream school, he understood that it was showing him how he was profoundly connected to life. This powerful insight led him to make real progress with his goals. 
During Dream School's 12-month transformational program, you'll learn to harness the power of your unconscious wisdom, decode the language of metaphor and symbol, discover mythological motives that shape your life, reveal unknown facets of your personality, unlock the door to inner wisdom. To enroll, just go to interpretmydream.net and sign up today to gain immediate access to the first three Dream School modules. Your best life awaits you at Dream School, and we can't wait to see you there. Today's dream is a bit special. It was submitted by a 17-year-old male who is currently a student. And I think both Dem and I were delighted to receive a dream from a, a young person. Yes. Which is um, not something we often have the privilege of looking into. So thank you to the uh, dreamer who shared this with us. He writes, I am walking and see a headlight lying on the road on a bridge and a baby crawling beside it. The baby narrowly escapes from being hit by cars. I see a black and red Bugatti parked, who is the owner of the headlight, and I denounce the driver to my football coach, who is also a policeman. I remember the car's number plate. I get a lot of attention due to this, and I greatly enjoy this. I start murdering people to get more attention. The first murder is with a pistol, the second with a revolver. I try to steal a gun from the football cafeteria for the third one, but I fear being found out by my trainer slash policeman, so I end up throwing the gun into the changing room. I confess to him that I am the murderer. My trainer accompanies me to a field nearby where some of my classmates from school are celebrating my birthday. There is a pool. On our way there, I explained to my trainer that I committed those murders because I had become addicted to the attention and adrenaline. It is dark, and suddenly my trainer starts walking faster. There is a donkey chasing us. We manage to evade it and climb the fence. The donkey jumps over the fence and attacks me. I crawl underneath the fence and arrive at the spot where my classmates are. As significant context, he writes, I am starting my last year of secondary school. The feeling in the dream, he writes, is that everything he did seemed really normal to him. <laughs> so, of course, our dreamer being 17 is such an important context around the possible developmental stage that this young fellow is in and what some of these uh, dream struggles, how they might be related to that developmental work. I am just tracing here uh, the dramatic arc uh, of the dream, of how the dream starts out and then what happens and then what happens. Here's a headlight lying on the road on a bridge and a baby crawling beside it. So that is the psychic situation as it is uh, in the dreamer. So what is a headlight? Well, it lights the road ahead, but it is detached. Mm -hmm. What is a bridge? Well, a bridge connects to uh, otherwise unconnected, usually pieces of land, and a baby uh, who, who's on the loose, <laughs> unattended, uh, who obviously needs care. And here we have these three, three ob objects, as it were, the headlight, the bridge, and the young potential crawling around in a dangerous situation. So that's our cast of characters, so to speak, at the beginning. And because a bridge is a transitional space, mm -hmm. for the most part, people don't just stop for any great length of time in the middle of a bridge. It's there explicitly to escort you uh, from one landmass to another, which is 
really substantial. And of course, if you had to go down that mountain, across that river, and up the other side, you'd really feel how trend how substantial that transition is. So the bridge facilitates the transition, making it easier, but it still spans a substantial difference in, in terrain. So whatever is happening for this young fellow, it's happening in this transitional strip mm -hmm. inside of his psyche. And it's, and fairy tales often, have bridges as the site of various things. You know, there's a troll in the middle of the bridge and you've got to somehow manage the troll in order to transition to whatever is on the other side. So, I mean, we could fantasize all kinds of things, you know, transitioning through late puberty, transitioning from high school to college, transitioning from boyhood to manhood, and the, you know, the long transition that he's in for that. So all of those ideas, I think, are humming along inside of him. And as Debbie was saying, that there's something about the headlight just lying on the bridge and the baby crawling that might give us some hints about what this transition is going to require from him. Right. One of the things that I, I just found myself curious about is, is the headlight mysteriously still shining in which case then it's become kind of a spotlight and we can imagine it has something to do with consciousness the truth is if your headlight plopped out of your car and it wasn't connected to the battery it's just inert if it's not broken it has this potential to illuminate if it's put into the right circumstance which could be helpful for him but even without it he's aware that there is a kind of infantile image that is in danger as it's on the bridge and cars are kind of zooming by. And part of him is recognizing that. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, part of him does not choose to intervene, yes. which I find very interesting. He just kind yes. of lets it ride. So what would you, you know, if this were a sort of a waking life situation, what would you do? Well, that's not what our dream ego does. Uh, he sees the red and black Bugatti, which I imagine is some whoop de doo type of car. I've never heard of it, but I'm not a car person. Uh, and instead, he denounces the driver of what I think must be a, some sort of special high status car to a football coach, also a policeman. So double image here of authority, male authority figure. What he enjoys is the attention that he gets from this. And so then he starts murdering people to get more attention. And he has a series of guns. But when he's about to steal the gun from the football cafeteria for the third one, and it seems to be ramping up from pistol to revolver to uh, presumably a more powerful type of weapon, then he is afraid of being found out by his trainer policeman, the authority figure. So there is a, a countervailing energy in the psyche and he ends up throwing the gun into the changing room. <laughs> so we have to hear that symbolically of something has to be changed. And now our dream ego confesses that he is the murderer. And that leads to the change of scene where off he goes into a field nearby where he's getting attention for his birthday from his peers and there's a pool, and he confesses the murders because he was attracted to the attention and adrenaline. And now it's dark, and the trainer policeman is walking faster. And then I, I just love this, and it relates, I think, really so serendipitously to uh, our Hans Christian Andersen tales of there's a donkey chasing us. A uh, jonkey can jump over the fence and attack. <laughs> so what is another word for donkey? An ass. An ass. 
(laughs) (laughs) And at the very end, our dream ego crawls underneath the fence. He is brought low, has to crawl under a fence, which is also a boundary marker. We started with the bridge. Now we have the fence. And he arrives at the spot where his classmates are, his peers. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think this dream is a bit of a morality tale, uh, not altogether unlike Hans Christian Andersen's proclivity for morality tales. I I think that's quite right. If I put just a developmental lens on it in terms of masculine psychology, so the boy is in transition on the bridge. The baby represents a certain kind of potential, as we said, but the potential is in danger. It has to be claimed and cared for. They can't just be marauding around, uh, putting itself at risk for some you know, terrible circumstance. And the headlight um, being left there, or the car only having one headlight, you know, suggests that the ability to navigate and even the ability to see fully is being compromised. So we have him in that condition. He doesn't know how to relate to the baby inside of him, and he's not really motivated to connect with it or even to rescue it from this tumult that's going on. He does go to the coach slash policeman as a kind of masculine authority figure, and he tries to mobilize the coach policeman to intervene. So there's an opportunity here for the young man to discover a heroic energy inside of himself, which is often required archetypally, regardless of gender, by the way, that we need to have a certain kind of heroic feeling to kind of cast ourselves into all the uncertainties of an adult life. But this young man is kind of trying to assign it back to the adult figures around him. Afterwards, he recognizes that he's really just interested in arousal, attention, and adrenaline. (laughs) And this whole section reminds me of gaming, of the gaming world, because the wide majority of games right now are shooting games. So going back in and finding your guns and starting shooting people everywhere, I mean, that's happening right now. Millions of kids are working hard to, you know, get their points and rise through the game doing exactly that. So to me, that's a regression back into that gaming fantasy world where he's more powerful than he really is. Instead of actually rescuing his own creative potential, he's kind of in this adrenaline dopamine cycle of gaming or fantasizing it. And then I love, love, love (laughs) that a donkey starts to them. <laughs> that is just I, I mean we just love the unconscious because who would put that in there right you know rationally and i think donkeys are symbols of work in our culture you know donkeys have been harnessed to human tasks for hundreds and hundreds of years and so donkeys are still used all over the world as assistants to human uh, work. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the donkey is actually the medicine is chasing down this young man and trying to force him to relate to the donkey like day to day, earthy, somewhat repetitive tasks of life, which are required at that age. I mean, you have to find your inner donkey and ride it through college and ride it into your vocation and ride it into saving up for your, you know, first house, that it's these donkey tasks that um, we have to do, which do not have to be horrible, but we trudge forward Mm -hmm. and get them done. Uh, Donkeys are such symbols of, of humility. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not horses. Uh, They're lowly. You know, Jesus rides uh, to his crucifixion. He rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. I'm I'm sure somebody would have loaned him a horse. But it's symbolic of of the humble place. And as you described, of the day-to-day 
step by step uh, doing what you have to do. It's interesting that the donkey can leap the fence, which is what our dream ego and his trainer initially do. They want to go over the fence. But uh, instead, uh, our dream ego winds up having to crawl underneath the fence. So the donkey, the fence, the crawling underneath, uh, it's all a message of come on down from the adrenaline high, which, um, as you said, uh, is often uh, associated today with gaming and this sort of falsely heroic uh, posturing. I'm interested in a couple of other things that are uh, probably, you know, somewhat details. But this um, fancy, I assume fancy car, red and black, red and black are primal colors. Uh, They were the first colors that humankind used for things like cave paintings. So they go way, way back in the psyche uh, as primal, instinctual kinds of colors. So I'm liking this uh, or just noticing the combination of the the high-status car with these uh, very primitive, very basic, beginning, very dramatic colors, forceful colors. I'm also interested in the image of this trainer policeman as an inner image of our dream ego's potential, along with, as you said, Joseph, the baby uh, representing potential that that needs care and tending. And then we have the trainer policeman, uh, the adult who has authority, who has knowledge, the dream ego confesses that, that he's the murderer. And it's the trainer part of our dreamer that takes him to the field nearby. And what's happening there? There's a pool, water, uh, something fluid, uh, and classmates are celebrating his birthday. And I wonder if that relates to the changing room, a a threshold of some kind, uh, a a new year, and a very human kind of celebration of today's your day, you, you're now age 18, let's say, and that we can celebrate. And that's where the dream ego winds up, is with his classmates having crawled under the fence. It really does represent a new beginning. Uh, uh, be that. Uh, be with your peers. This is where your trainer part of yourself and a donkey part of yourself ha- have taken you to. Yeah, I'm thinking about the the birthday as the marker of development. Mm-hmm. That you know, there's turbulence in the dream. There's a lot of different factors, which is not uncommon. You know, in the adolescent psyche, I mean, we were all turbulent when we were <laughs> young teenagers. I mean, it was just incredibly intense, and all these neurologic things are still growing. These connections are still happening. So it's just. <laughs> this really dramatic arc in the dream, I think, is reflective of who we are. But I, I love the, the sense that through all the struggle, he arrives back into a kind of internal community that actually celebrates him, that is wholesome. Mm-hmm. It's very different from the danger on the bridge or the murdering or the fleeing, you know, or the dangerous donkeys of the world. <laughs> that he's he's back and held in the container of community, which I think is so, so important for all of us when we were teenagers. And, and, you know, I can remember just having certain best friends in high school and junior high school and just needing people to tell everything to each other so that we could kind of hold this incredibly intense, confusing world that is that's happening around us. I am going to fold in something uh, from his context. He doesn't provide a lot of context. But what he does say is, I am starting my last year of secondary school. He doesn't say, I'm going to be a senior in high school. Mm-hmm. 
so secondary school instead of high school, uh, already the other polarity has been referenced as if it's, you know, it's second, second after primary school. And his last year, ra rather than senior year, so I, I'm just kind of um, musing about that. And without the dreamer here, this is real speculation. But I wonder what his senior year is going to be like and what our dreamer might be feeling, expecting, hoping for, uh, and anxious about uh, fo following uh, completion of high school. Um, because your seniors are the kings of high school, and yet uh, there's a transition coming that's imaged in the dream by the bridge and the fence. I wonder if um, if he is lives outside of the U.S. Um, there's a couple of terms oh. of phrases, and secondary school. Is, uh, is a way that sometimes people refer to a British school systems or Australian school systems. Ooh. So I'm wondering if what we're just picking up on is that there's just a little shift away from yeah. how we might normally think about um, the educational yeah. arc. Yeah, that's a good point. And yet there is a transition coming. Oh, absolutely. You know, he's in that last year. And if he is, for instance, in the UK, there's all of this vocational testing going on that is all of these ways in which one's trajectory is going to be determined, uh, and in some ways determined by the system, the governmental system itself. So there's an awful lot riding mm -hmm. on this last year, based on my understanding. And, and if it is a US fellow, senior year is also your college application year and your SATs and all that kind of stuff, yeah. all of these tests to kind of get through. So I think flagging that uh, makes perfect sense as such a significant piece. Also, you know, the last year in high school is often the opportunity to finally be, you know, at the top of the hill. Yes. <laughs> you know, you've been the low man on the total totem pole since you came in as a freshman and little by little you finally physically and psychologically mature. So now yeah. you're kind of part of the alpha system you know, <laughs> in the school. Oh, only to be brought low again. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're going to be a college freshman and back you go. Back on the bottom, <laughs> 100%. So what I would say to the dreamer is, you know, the dream sounds reasonable given where one might be at 17 and even though it's a bit intense, you know, the dream maker is helping you, is with you. You've got a companion at your side trying to nudge you along. And there's a couple of really, really beautiful moments of self-confrontation. I had become addicted to the attention and the adrenaline. I mean, like you've got an inner analyst who is <laughs> right with you telling you something that probably would be very hard to hear from uh, an external person. You know, but you found that brilliant piece of wisdom right, right there in the dream. So that's something to really journal on, really think about, do some research. You have all kinds of access online. And this process of sensation seeking is something to really learn about and to bring consciousness to. And if you like to meditate, Jung would say, you know, we can go back into the dreams in our fantasies and maybe pick up the baby <laughs> and see if it's okay and what it might need. And inner babies are kind of mythic babies. And sometimes just going back and picking up the baby and you know, taking it with you, or even sometimes people will find a place in their body to store the baby so that whatever this creative potential is, mm -hmm. that it has a symbolic place to live inside of you. And for some people, that can really stimulate some creative thinking. So there's a lot of excitement and some real gifts in the dream. And Joseph, I'm aware 
that our dreamer has evoked in you a kind of, of kindliness and coaching uh, aspect. And I, I'm very much allied with that. Uh, so uh, he, here, too, is sort of an, an analytic, encouraging coaching function come alive at uh, a very important uh, and tumultuous, often tumultuous uh, time of life as uh, our dreamers preparing to enter the next stage of development and young adulthood. This, the way that the dream evoked a kind of paternal feeling <laughs> yes. in me that I've kind of taken on the role of the trainer policeman for a few moments there. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Exactly. Uh, yeah. we, we are with you, and we are cheering you on. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.